Grow, Sell, and Retire is the podcast for the lazy overachiever. B.D. Dalton, author of True Gravity and Grow, Sell, and Retire, is here to give you his 25 years of secrets, tips, and systems to take your business to the next level. This is your chance to find out what is working in sales, marketing, and running your business. If you stop learning, you stop burning. Now, here's your host, BD, with today's GSR Podcast. Hey, Grow, Sell, and Retire listeners. This is BD Dalton hosting your secrets for the lazy overachiever. Nobody likes to be called lazy, but guess what? If you want to make sure you get something done right and most effectively, sometimes you have to give it to a lazy person because they're going to get it done quicker. Today, we're going to talk to one of my favorite people that talks about client experiences. This is Jeff Belcora, author of Deal. And this is really getting to that discovery, engagement, and leverage that helps get your clients engaged with you. This guy's amazing. We have an award-winning client experience that we've built at Taurus Wealth. And we did that making and using ideas from Steve Moore, one of my first podcasts that I did for you guys. And then the second one is through Jeff Belcora, the guy that you're going to listen to today. This guy gets in-depth, goes into people's brains, asks them the questions... And guess what? They shut up and listen. Because one of the key things that we have, and we'll talk about it, is listening. Jeff Belcora, he has studied making sure that you have an amazing client experience, client engagement, and asking the right questions and sitting back and lapping up the right information so that you can have a great client experience for your top clients. Sit back, grab a pen, make sure you're taking notes, because here comes Jeff Belcora on the Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. Listen up. Welcome, Jeff Belcora, to the Grow, Sell, and Retire podcast. How did you question the expert? Yeah, well, you know, I actually started in the area of um, healthcare. So I, I've been working in healthcare for 15 plus years and it turns out that um, oncologists and surgeons and other specialists have kind of the same dynamic as financial advisors in that uh, part of their work, part of their job is to discover the patient agenda and then address those needs. Uh, and uh, it's not something that necessarily happens very well in healthcare. Uh, and so I, I studied communication and decision making. Uh, and, um, you know, through many years of transcribing recordings and analyzing the transcripts, uh, developed different frameworks and approaches, uh, and then did many clinical trials in the area of healthcare. So there's a really rigorous standard for research in healthcare. Um, yeah, you had, when, you, when you were going through that, I think one of the, the things that I made it, uh, fairly shocking fact and being in the UK it's is people don't get a lot of choice of their treatments or anything else like that what and your questioning came through interviewing ladies going through cancer treatments right and yeah I started over here so that was it's a kind of an odd thing to then go into financial advice or sales or anything like that so how did you get to that? I know it's 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 been quite a journey. So as you as you mentioned, I started in in the area of breast cancer. Where uh, look, even in the UK, I think there's um, a recognition that there's actually a lot of choices uh, to be made that are quite um, preference sensitive. So if you're if you're diagnosed with breast cancer, this is also true in prostate cancer for men. You know, uh, in either kind of condition. Um, there are, you know, different options involving surgery and radiation and uh, sometimes chemotherapy and now hormone therapy or other, other types of modalities. And they really have different risks and benefits. And so part of the, if you're in, in the field of healthcare, uh, the, the term of art for all this is shared decision making. And actually, the, uh, the UK has been a strong leader uh, in this area of shared decision making in, in healthcare. Um, and, and I, you know, I was working away in that, in that realm, in that arena. And I understood, I knew that it was a very portable concept that really this, this kind of communication and inquiry and understanding the client agenda, uh, this really happens in every professional realm and every advisory realm. 
but it wasn't until I got a call from Russell Investments and Kevin Hofberg there had followed my work and we knew each other and he said, um, you know, we really need to translate this work into financial services that um, financial advisors really need just as much help uh, with this this kind of um, discovery and, and patient engagement or sorry, client engagement as, as doctors do. And I say, but I think that the, the big thing for me is that you, you keep changing, you know, idioms in and different, different words, things, but, but in general, a, a patient is receiving a high level of service. That's very emotional and engaged. It might not feel like it all the time, but when you're going through something like that, you're very highly emotionally engaged. And I think the thing that you've you've been able to work on, and and all the stuff that I've read and done with you, is that it's getting the client emotionally engaged. That that's a huge thing that people don't do enough. They see it as sometimes not everybody. Obviously, people listening to this podcast are a little bit elite above that, but still, it's a sale versus an emotional engagement. So, yeah, it's a big thing. Yeah, I think in in both arenas there's um there's the the kind of hidden agenda which is, you know, what the patient or the client is really thinking and feeling underneath the surface in terms of their goals and their priorities and their life journey. And too often in in both areas they're confronted with a professional who, you know, in the in the, the words of the healthcare, you know, people uh typically want to take care of the disease but not the whole patient. Because when you're a very specialized, you know, surgeon or oncologist, um, you know, the expression is, you know, more and more about less and less. <laughs> so that's just the curse of specialization. And I think that happens in financial services, too, that we get um, financial advisors who become quite specialized and quite technically competent uh, and, you know, to some extent lose some of the lose track of of. What what is the client journey? What journey is the client on? And over and over again, what we find out is that um, you know the client properly guided. You, you need to find out what is the money for. And there's a whole a whole realm of in in financial services called financial life planning. Uh, George Kinder and Mitch Anthony and others really pioneered this. I think as far back as the 1970s. Um, and it's unfortunately, from my point of view, it's been a somewhat quiet corner of the industry compared to, you know, the mass, mass market approach in financial services. Um, but my, my approach is completely consistent with, with that notion of, you know, financial life planning is really, it's about what's the money for and helping people shape their, their goals and realize their goals outside the portfolio. Uh, and that's where that's where actually most value is created or destroyed is, you know, we live outside the portfolio. Uh, does that make sense? Everything else is based on cost, if not, isn't it? If, if you don't know what it's for, then you're just you're just trying to compete your way to the bottom of whatever your service costs. Yeah, I think that's, you know, the portfolio management, as we've seen, is being commodified. And so. Um, the fee structure in the U.S. Everyone's under margin compression for for money management, and so now I think um, I think advisors need to embrace the idea that they are life coaches and life consultants uh, who are really trying to help people um, forge you know a, a life path uh, and have the resources they need to enjoy you know their dreams, and you know sometimes. Advisors say to me, "Why?" Well, but I don't want to become a therapist, and uh, I don't think that's necessary. But I think coaching and consulting are absolutely critical to the uh, to the skill mix. And that's awesome. And then the, the the funny thing is that all the stuff we're talking about now from financial advice, and you talked about with medical, um, we're applying to the law firm that I'm running now, and also the consultancy business. So it it it's, spans all sorts of stuff. So even though we're using nomenclature of financial advisors, portfolio, everybody's working on different compressions inside of their, their cost basis and things like that. But when we look at when you started walking back and when my team's gone through your overall process, what do you think for, for anybody in sales, financial advisors, anything else, what do you think professionals need or the greatest tool is in their toolbox? You know, I think it begins with the need assessment. 
So we can call that discovery, or I, I've been using the phrase needs assessment, or some people say uh, kind of a goal clarification or values clarification. I think that's where it starts. I think that's your 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 discovery is your is your most powerful toolbox tool you know tool in the toolkit um, because if you don't diagnose what's going on properly, then you have n- almost no hope of being a problem solver for your, for your clients. Is that, is that consistent with your experience? You've been, you've been using some of the, some of the specific techniques and tools that I. Yeah. The, the, the beautiful on. thing is because, because as salespeople um, and problem solvers, we want to get problems solved fast. So the sales teams or, or the brokers or anybody else, the, the lawyers uh, we've be using your processes, we've taken out the initial engagement being with the broker um, and put it back onto the team so that we're not instantly trying to find a solution. So the discovery comes through the team. Instead of trying to find a solution first, we need to find the, the, the pain points, if you want to call it that, and and where they're going. So using your stuff, it's just been – discovery is, is huge. It makes us it, – it, it is that level above. Um, and and we've also found that with through what you've done is if they don't do that, then they're not going to be a good client for us usually. So if they don't yeah. disclose that, then that's kind of our first velvet rope before we even get to price or, or value add or anything else like that. It's actually, this is how we do it. And if you don't do this, then you will never be a good client for us because this is us engaging with you and discovering how we work together. Yeah, it's really a two-way street. I mean, um, uh, if, if a, a prospect uh, does not want to share uh, what's below the tip of the surface, uh, and and really get to the true needs and the true agenda. Uh, it's going to be very hard for anyone to help them, uh, you know, solve address their their real needs. And then uh, this is the big thing is because w- why do you think that professionals, not all professionals, but in in general, it does come across this way. Why do we have such a hard time just listening? <laughs> Yeah, that's the uh, sixty-four million dollar question. I, I, um, BD, that's a that's that's a very profound question. I, uh, I think it comes down to there's a charitable answer. You know, one angle on that is is charitable, which is that uh, professionals may fall in love with their profession and with their solutions, and they may be very eager um, to kind of cut to the chase and and demonstrate and talk about what they can do. Uh, and that becomes very comfortable for them. And so through that kind of comfort, you end up with a lot of telling and selling. And uh, and some of it is very well-intentioned, like some of it is very educational and, and you know, teaching oriented. So I, I respect that. Um, but it's, it's pretty misplaced. When I analyze, you know, advisors who work with me, record their interactions with clients and then we transcribe them and we go over them word for word and we, we, we calculate, we take measures. So when I calculate the total airtime that a professional is occupying, even in a discovery call where they're, or a discovery meeting where they're meant to be surfacing issues from the client side, they're still talking well over half the time. It's, it's very typical for a, um, a, a professional in a, in a discovery situation to speak, you know, two thirds of the time. Now, so with, really, so it, and interrupting, <laughs> which is something we do horribly, but go ahead. I, I would challenge any listener here today that if you, if you want to go out and you want to improve your communication skills and Jeff works on this with, with our teams and things like that, ask your client one time or one client to record the, your meeting Say you're only going to use it for internal purposes, but that you are using the recording to make sure that you increase their client experience. Yeah. You know, BD, I would say I would go a step further, which is um, make the recording for the client. This is what we started doing in in healthcare is we realized that um, patients would, would come into clinics and they might be alone, but they might have family members remote remote family members, you know, who would very much like to know what's going on, or the patient might have memory issues or might just want to be able to recall the information that they discussed. So we started off making recordings in healthcare for the, for the benefit of the patient. And then, and we would give the patient a copy, but for risk management purposes, we would keep a copy. 
Um, and then we started analyzing the recordings from our point of view for quality improvement purposes. So I think, um, I think it's a, it's a nice thing to do to, to offer this as a benefit for, for clients is to say, Hey, you know, we're going to be discussing really vital matters to your life today. And, um, you may want to review this and I'd like to take the pressure off of taking notes. Uh, so let's have a recording and we'll each get a copy and then, um, that'll be useful for us, uh, as we move forward. <laughs> and, and it, it's a very interesting thing, BD, that very few people refuse the, the recording. They, they see the value for themselves and they're also impressed that you're taking things seriously on your end. It is amazing because you, you, you become that next level professional and that's, you know, for, for everybody's benefit, it's just, it's great. So when, when you're walking through and you did deal, tell us about the select process and tell us what, what the letters stand for. Yeah, sure. We'll all be in the show, the show notes, but, but walk us yeah. through the select process because it's always fun. You know, Michelle and Nadia still, still, t- we all still talk about it. Good. Well, you know, I should start with the iceberg framework. So um, the, the the iceberg is a conceptual model or a metaphor where we're all kind of walking around. We're all icebergs in that there's things at the tip of the iceberg that are that we're consciously aware of and that we're willing to share. So when we engage in conversation, um, that's what we exchange. That's the kind of information we exchange is everything that's at the tip of the iceberg. But each of us has a whole, you know, iceberg under the waterline. And that's, uh, you know, like with icebergs, that's actually where most of the stuff is. And these are either things that we're not even consciously aware of, but they're kind of latent in our, in our consciousness. Or there are things that we are consciously aware of, but we're too shy or defensive, or we have some reason why we're not willing to articulate them. So that's the first thing I'd like people to understand is that, you know, when you engage with a client, um, what you're going to get in the beginning is the tip of the iceberg. And that's perfectly fine. And that's, that's absolutely the place to start. Um, but you really would like a methodical way. And I think this is my, you know, my scientific claim to fame is having a protocol, having discovered a systematic protocol for getting down into below the waterline for, you know, plumbing the depths of the iceberg. And so like, like you mentioned, it's a, it's a protocol, like the acronym is SELECT, S-L-C-T. Um, and what it does, what it is, is you start off by simply writing down everything anybody is telling you at the tip of the iceberg. So when I start a discovery interview, typically I'll say to people, uh, you know, BD, um, as you were on your way to this meeting or thinking about our, our interaction, did you make any notes to yourself um, or did you have any thoughts? And let's start with that. So we start you off at the tip of the iceberg and then I'll take notes and I'll write down whatever you tell me is at the tip of the iceberg. So that's scribing. That's the S in select. And then the next step is typically people have a half dozen issues. You know, there's that rule of thumb, seven plus or minus two issues that you can hold in working memory. So, you know, typically people share a half dozen issues and then we simply circle back over them. And this is the theory of progressive disclosure is that if you told me six things and I want to know more and I want you to go deeper into the iceberg, the most comfortable thing is to go back over the things you've already revealed and ask you to elaborate on them. So we call that laddering because we're sort of building a ladder down into the iceberg. And then um, the third step is checking. That's the C in select. And that's where we get to bring out clever questions because now what we want to do is check the width of the iceberg. So something that maybe the client hasn't mentioned or the prospect hasn't mentioned yet, uh, we might then say in the third round of questioning, we might say, oh, you haven't really mentioned, you know, your family members. Can you tell me a little bit about your family situation? So that's checking. And then the last step is triaging, which is where you take all, your, all the notes you've been taking and you go back over the recording and you create a discovery note, which is a written summary. I try to always keep it to one page. And the reason for doing this is Mark Twain said, I write so I can see what I think. So you want, you want to be able to give the client a work product or the prospect a work product and say, hey, this is my report. You know, this is the needs assessment we conducted. And it's in one page and it's bullet, you know, bullet outline format. Uh, and typically, prospects feel very good about that. They, they like Mark Twain, they say, oh, now I can see what I'm thinking. That's and it's really, it's the whole iceberg, ideally. 
That's awesome. So what would you say, using all these things or, or may, may not even be in this realm, what do you think was your greatest success professionally so far? Oh, um, well, I, as I mentioned, I think that's the, the select protocol is perhaps my, uh, my scientific discovery is, is in through pretty rigorous research, we've demonstrated that um, using that protocol, you can stimulate a lot more disclosure than any other interview protocol or, or certainly than usual care that we've been able to test it against. Um, and, and the implications of that are pretty profound. So I think that's a success um, because either in healthcare, you know, you get to the real issues and you're able to help patients navigate through life and death decisions, or in, in financial services, you're able to really address the true client need. And that has you know, results in better outcomes for the client, but it also results in better business outcomes for the advisor. So we've seen, you know, through this work, uh, but with better discovery and decision making with with clients, we've seen the close rate go up dramatically in in controlled studies. Uh, we've seen the consolidation rate go up dramatically. I'm talking about like you know from 22 percent to 48 percent, or the consolidation rate from 26 percent to 37 percent. Uh, we've seen um, referrals increase. Uh, and we've seen uh, we've seen retention, which is usually pretty high among advisors, but we've seen a good impact on that. So it's a nice mix of you know by doing this kind of qualitatively client centered activity of of discovery and decision making, you end up with with better outcomes for everyone. That's really cool. And so it's uh, moving through the process, asking those. So do you have you've asked some decent questions throughout this obviously you're a trained professional but what what are what's one question that everybody should ask and what's one question that everybody should get rid of in their in their questioning process maybe yeah um so the my you know my favorite opening is to ask people um have they made any notes to themselves that's a question that is a is a great opener. Instead of asking about the weather or small talk, uh, you know, which is establishes some comfort but doesn't really get you anywhere. You can ask someone at the top of any conversation, "Hey, look, um, I've been looking forward to speaking with you. Um, on your end, have you made any notes or have you had any thoughts that we should start with in this in this interaction?" And that kind of gets people straight to into the issues at the tip of the iceberg. So that's one I would add to everyone's repertoire. Awesome. And then you mentioned, is there one to take subtract? away? One get rid of right off. Stop. Uh-huh. So besides the, how's the weather? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Get rid of that. But, but also, um, you know, Simon Sinek has had a big influence on people by asking them to start with why. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great question to ask introspectively is, you know, start with why. Um, I actually think it's the wrong place to start with, to, it's the wrong place to start with, with clients. And the reason is it's, um, it's trying to jump into the bottom of the iceberg. And, you know, you're asking people a question about their motivations and things that they may not quite be willing to share with you yet. Um, and, and it can put people on the defensive, like they have to have a reason so I would say in, in the realm of, of client discovery, don't start with why. Save that for the, fir- for the third round of questioning. You know, the, I mentioned the first round is scribing, the second round is laddering. And then when you get to the checking and, and checking in with people, you've built a little bit of trust at that point. You're a good listener. You've been, you know, um, assessing their needs up to that point. Then you can dig into their motivations a little bit more. Does that... Ring oh, that's, that's, that's actually awesome. That's actually awesome. The funny thing is, I, I interviewed Peter Docker, who is um, Cynic's right hand man, about uh, yeah. about eight months ago. So, and it's fun because to start with why I think, and you're you're right. Is people people try to work it on everybody else? It, you know, when you work when you work it on yourself, it's much easier because you're the one hiding stuff from yourself. <laughs> yeah. You try to use it on somebody else. It's like asking somebody to marry you on their first date. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of of Cynic's work, so it's just this is a tweak for um, it's for nice. advisors. It's a, it's a sequencing. It's a, you know it's a question of sequencing. Yeah, pace. It's all about pace. Yeah. So what's um, so big goals that you have in place for 2018? What's what are you looking to accomplish this year? Uh, you know I'm um, I've got 
several hats that I'm wearing. So on the, in, I'm still doing healthcare about half the time. Okay. And in that realm, I, um, I've started a, a, a nonprofit organization called the Patient Support Corps, which is training um, pre-medical students and medical students to, to do this kind of discovery uh, with patients before they go see the, their specialists, surgeons and oncologists and that kind of thing. So that we're, this is called task shifting. We're trying to take, you know, junior people and have them do spend an hour in a very relaxed way that no one ever, you know, no one in healthcare ever relaxes and spends that, that amount of time with you. So, um, so I'm raising money for that. So I, I have a goal of raising 250000 uh, philanthropically for that. So that's a big, that's a big goal for, for 2018. And is that, is that on your website? Is that, is that linked to that on your website? No, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm raising money very locally. So, uh, I'm doing it through, um, development work here at the University of California, San Francisco. Okay. And, uh, I think when the time, when we've established this kind of base baseline, then we'll probably spread the word and try to get, uh, kind of more global. Um, I think if, uh, if people are interested in, in you know, the work that I'm doing both in, in healthcare and in uh, financial services, uh, the website is a good place to request information. So there's a button there. Uh, guidesmith.com is the, uh, is the website. And so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we put that in the show notes too. Great. Thanks. Yeah. And the, um, you know, as the name suggests with Guidesmith, I'm, I'm actually bridging both or, you know, multiple worlds. Uh, I'm, I'm, really focused on training professionals to be better guides, to guide their clients to good decisions in these complex areas, whether it's healthcare or, or financial services. Really cool. So what, what tech are you using that's kind of your favorite stuff right now? Is, what what well, tech is taking you forward? What's your favorite thing tech work? Yeah, well, you know, I'll, 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 stay, I'll stay on the theme of recording. I'm using um, an app and a website called Rev.com which um, you, they have a very cost-effective transcription service. And so you can, on, on your phone, you can record calls or, or meetings uh, and then upload to their service for transcription. Now, I do want to warn your, your listeners that if you're using this, um, when you upload it, it goes to the cloud. So you, you have to be very careful that there's not any personally identifiable information uh, when I when I make recordings, it's interesting actually. Typically, when I start the recording and when we conduct a discovery interview, um, we don't actually use any identifiable information. We don't even necessarily need to use someone's first name, much less their last name, and we leave out their email and the date and you know the, the you know account numbers or anything like that. So discovery is really holistic about everything outside the portfolio. So most of the time, there's no uh, concern, and and you know Rev has all the usual security measures, but I'm just you just need to be um, very careful now nowadays with where where your information is going, and and when it goes to the cloud, you need to make sure it's it's completely clean. Definitely. So rev dot com. The just yeah. www dot rev dot com. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I'd, I'd be curious if you test it out. I've you know I assume it's global. Um, so uh, why don't you test it out in the UK? And uh, I will. I'll test. I'll test it out, and maybe right maybe we'll, maybe we'll transcribe this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, have them transcribe this absolutely, and then uh, let your listeners know on the show notes or something. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll test it out. And so, if you were to look at so, and we walked through guidesmith dot com, but so what valuable quick fire top tip? You know, we talked about the question. What top tip do you have for the listeners? Just to say, hey, you know, we we've done better questioning, done this type of stuff in in what you've seen medical financial advice just maybe used on you what what's a top tip for us well i'm going to go back you know i don't sound like a broken record here but i am going to go back to recording you know if you're serious about improving your client experience and your communication there's just no better way than to record and transcribe i uh, and and i'm certainly happy to share you know lessons I've learned about how to go about that. But um, let, let me say a few words about why it's so valuable is that when you listen to a recording of yourself, it is painful. Um, but but it, it, what it does is it makes you re-experience your interaction in slow motion. And in fact, the best possible way to do this is to transcribe your own recordings. So especially when you're, when you're getting started. And the reason for that is that you can only type about 
one sixth as fast as you talk. And so literally your, your interaction with a prospect or a client enters your consciousness through your fingertips in slow motion. And this is what, you know, some um, researchers have called deep work. Like if you're really looking to improve, it's not just practice that's going to make you better. It's, it's a particular kind of high quality, deliberate practice. And this is true whether we're talking about golf or tennis or, you know, any sport or any activity. Um, you know, you can, you can practice over and over again and not really get much better. Or you can do some kind of very focused and deliberate practice and see dramatic results. And that's what recording can do for any professional. Uh, it, My great grandma used to say, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can practice it wrong all day long and you're not going to get any better. Yeah. And there's a lot of research now to support that point. That's really good. So anything else? I mean, that's, that's been phenomenal for, for everybody. And I think it's, it's great that you've been able to come on the show, give us some, some pointers and walk us through things. And so you've got deal. Is there another, any other books coming out in the, (laughs) you know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, what I'm finding is that I'm interacting now with people through uh, my um, my email distribution list, and so I think you're getting you're getting my emails, and anyone can join on on GuideSmith, and that's where I'm doing most of my writing. Is uh, you've been I think getting the uh, trying to be as you know pragmatic as possible in in orienting people to to good tips and best practices, and and maybe maybe I'll put those together again in a book. Um, at some point, but that's, that's kind of where my focus is in terms of writing and sharing. That's cool. Thank you so much for your time today. And hopefully, in a, like I said, in the show notes, I'll have, have all the ways that people can get a hold of you and look at it. And, and if, if you, you definitely need to look at it because even though Jeff talks about financial advice and talks about healthcare, this is, it's applicable to anything, you know, sitting back, listening, going deeper, asking the right questions. It's a, it's a huge, huge and valuable commodity that people don't don't value enough. Yeah, it's good for your personal relationships too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so so much, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, BD. I'm a big fan. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for joining us on Grow, Sell, and Retire. For more information, tools, or to book one of our team members to work with your team, business, or to speak at your event or conference, visit BartDaltonConsulting.com or email contact at BartDaltonConsulting.com. Buy the book True Gravity on Amazon. If you want to work for the rest of your life, that is your business. If you don't, that is ours.